Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Together, we'll explore and enjoy content and conversations around mastering transitions. In our relations, our wellness, our careers, our families, and especially in our missions and visions. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I have with me today a dear longtime colleague, fellow teacher, best-selling author. Welcome, Jennifer Pastelov, to the podcast. Hi. Hi, my sweet. Uh, You're an author, a public speaker, a poet, a writing coach, and you are the creator of the shame loss movement. You are a self-proclaimed real weirdo, just like me. (laughs) That's why we love each other. You're also the best-selling author of a book called On Being Human. That is the first place I would like to stop on this train. Tell me about On Being Human This is a beautiful offering to the world, one that is very important for all to read. And I'd love to hear about how that began. Um, That began on a snowy day in the 70s when I was born (laughs) in Philadelphia. Um, That began, you know, I was always a writer. I really was since childhood. And I lost my way for a long time, which uh, had a lot to do with shame and I joke, accidentally dropped out of college because it was supposed to be one semester before my senior year and um, got a summer job that turned into 14 years in West Hollywood and really, really got lost. Um, And then I found my way out, my escape route from that life of misery. Not that waiting tables is necessarily misery, but I believe for me, you know, being an artist and a writer from that doing those things or making anything or touching my creative spirit. That's like being a walking dead person. And um, I was also severely depressed and doing nothing about that except yoga, which was saving my life. So my way out of the restaurant was becoming a yoga teacher, which I never really wanted to do. I loved yoga. I didn't really want to be a teacher, but it was my way out. And then I began writing again. And I'm abbreviating this, but what I did really was combine all the things, you know, all my years of waitressing and my sort of people skills and my weirdo skills and my writing and yoga. And I started creating these workshops that I made up that were a lot more me than just teaching yoga. At first they were called the manifestation workshop because everything I did was after my beloved teacher and friend Wayne Dyer and everything was about manifesting. And the subtitle was On Being Human. And eventually I dropped the first part because I realized the being human part was what interests me Mm. and what connected us. And I was writing all the time and posting things on the internet and saying I was writing a book, but not really writing a book. And then I finally did it. I finally stopped talking and did the thing. Um, It's my life. You know, I, the elevator pitch I've kind of, given is like, it's a story of someone who wanted to die, but didn't die. (laughs) And, um, wow. Yeah. And it's a story of loss, losing my dad at age eight and losing my hearing and really finding my way, which doesn't mean like I've necessarily found it. I'm finding it every day. It's a memoir, but it's a memoir ish. I think perhaps it also could have been, um, under self-help because it is kind of like my workshop. So there's, you know, I'm speaking to the reader a lot. So it's a bit of a hybrid. And, you know, I have ADD, so it's also kind of very pastel in that way. <laughs> but it's really me, and it's really um, unfiltered, and I don't hold back. That doesn't mean I share every detail. It's just that I don't hide in shame. And that's my declaration. Mm. Mm. I love the fact that you haven't even mentioned your hearing loss except for one little tiny hint uh, in this entire first four or so minutes of talking about this beautiful book. I would love to just teach our listener about how that came to pass and how you've managed it all this time. Yeah, I'm laughing because, you know, 
um, full disclosure, listeners, before we got on, I was like, where's the video? You know, because I read lips. And so like, I'm sitting here, like, my face is like pressed into the computer and like working really hard to hear. Um, but right now, you know, I'm struggling. It's not, it's not even that I'm struggling. I'm working really, really hard to hear Elena. Um, I have high tech hearing aids that thank God were gifted to me Hmm. because I guess I, you know, I put myself out there a lot on the internet and word got around and these were gifted to me. And also I was asked to promote them. So they were gifted and I got paid for it, which is like the luckiest thing ever. But, you know, I hid it for a long time and it was progressive. And it's funny you say that because this morning, you know, I don't sleep with my hearing aids in. And this morning I got up to get coffee and my husband was talking to me. And it's so irritating. After all these years, he still doesn't realize that without my hearing aids, I can't hear. I mean, 16 years. So I said to him, God, I wonder what life would be like if I didn't have my hearing aids, because it really is terrifying. And as someone who didn't grow up in deaf culture, like capital D deaf with you know, using sign language, that's a different Mm -hmm. story. I didn't. And so without my hearing aids, I can't hear. And I also have raging tinnitus, which is ringing and whooshing in my head all the time. So I have both things um, and it's maddening. So it's been progressive over time and it's just gotten worse and worse. And I was in denial for a very long time because I was ashamed. I thought I was broken And also because I was afraid and I was afraid if I named it, that it would make it real. You know, I say that out loud and it sounds so silly. And yet I know everyone understands that. Right. So progressively it got worse. And to be honest, the first time I really, really got honest about it was in 2008 when I did a teacher training with Annie Carpenter. I remember I took that month off of waiting tables. It was like meditation or something. And she'd say, close your eyes. And I, for the first time I said this out loud, I said, well, I can't close my eyes because then I can't hear. And it was like, this is such a simple thing, but I'd never said that out loud. And she said, oh, that's why you're always, you know, I must look at people's mouths instead of their eyes. I know I do. (laughs) And if you don't know, I'm hard of hearing. Maybe I don't even think about that, but it dawned on her. And then from then on, she just made sure I was always in the front and I was always taken care of. Mm. And it still took a, a few more years before I got really honest and began to lead with that, lead with the thing that caused me shame to be able to tell people right up front, hey, by the way, I read lips. Hey, by the way, I'm deaf, you know, um, and now it's the first thing that I lead with, but it's hard. And it's also, you know, not to sound like a super woo or like I'm bypassing, but it's been a real gift because I have a reputation of being like the best listener anyone's ever met. And that's because I've had to really teach myself other ways of listening. Right. And two things at once. It also fucking sucks. (laughs) Right. Right. Tell me, you now have a child. I do. He's turning six next week. It's um, wow. It's really crazy because, you know, when I was 38, which was the age my father was when he died. So that's, you know, profound. Um, I got pregnant kind of by accident, I guess. You know, I didn't really want to, but I started feeling uh, pressure from the world like I should be because I was married and I was of a certain age. And you know, I told my husband this one time, let's just, you know, not be safe. And I get pregnant and I didn't want to be, I panicked. And I remember calling you and you were like, Mm -hmm. write a letter. I don't even remember exactly what you said, but you said like, write a letter to this child. I said, write a letter to this baby coming into this family, exactly what this person can expect to see and feel when this person arrives. And if I recall correctly, upon the saying of that, you got really excited. Like, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. I did. And well, you know what it did? <laughs> My favorite words are, it's going to be okay. And I got you. And so what that did, like, you calmed me. You know what I mean? I was so terrified. And your presence was just calming. And that also gave me something actionable to do. It wasn't just like, you know, pray or whatever. Like. Gave me something to do. It ended up being a topic and it was okay. It really was. Um, 
And then a couple of years later, I got pregnant again. Again, it was not planned, but it was perfect. This was the person who, without a doubt, chose me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I chose mm-hmm. oh, That's so me. beautiful. So beautiful. So he's now turning six. Oh, and yeah. And yes, that's major. I'm actually just finishing a parenting course that I think you'll really love. I'll get you the transcript. And you're going to really enjoy it. You're my like uh, mommy role model. I remember like, you know, I looked at your Instagram sometimes and you were like, um, you know, my son and I at the end of the night, I mean, I don't even know how old he was like 12 or I mean, he wasn't an adult and he wasn't a toddler. Mm -hmm. And you would say, and correct me because I often make up stories, but you would you said something like, and then at the end of the night, you know, I asked him where I could have done better today or something like that. And I was like, damn, I need to just follow everything she does. It's true. I started doing that when he was three and a half. I could not recommend it any more highly, but it's a way, you know, it's what you do. It's a way for you, a way for us, a way for our listener to really practice listening, like in really tough spots with a kid. We are raised as kids of the 70s and let's say 80s, we were raised that the kids do not have a voice. The kids should not have a say in what goes on in the household. And I decided that was not okay. I turned it over on its head and I said, I want to know what you're interested in. And I would pretty much always give him a choice between two things, whether it was the jacket he was putting on or the food we were going to eat. I always gave him choices. And now the kid is extremely independent knows exactly what he wants, and is present for himself in a really cool way, which all of us have struggled to get there, to be present for ourselves. We never felt like we had a choice. In fact, we felt like we were being, you know, lorded over and in some cases abused, in many cases just traumatized. Um, But I think think this is a way we can change things by just asking that one simple question. Well, it's funny. I mean, I'm pretty upfront with everything. So I remember I panicked though. And I saw that because I was scared to ask the question, you know, I was scared, even though probably he was like four or five. I'm not down on myself. Look, I create no bullshit motherhood. I'm, I'm clear. I'm a great mom and two things at once. I fuck up a lot, you know, Mm -hmm. um, we all do. Right. And yet I know (laughs) I'm aware when I'm doing things that I'm like, huh, Um, yeah, this isn't the best. And this isn't just with parenting. This is with whatever. And I still keep doing it, which is why on being human ends with the words now what, because being self-aware is great and all, but the now what is more important. So, you know, I'm the breadwinner and I work all the time and, and sometimes I don't have the best boundaries with work and I know I'm working a lot and that bugs him. So sometimes I'm afraid to ask him because he's going to say what I already know. Hmm. you know, but now that I'm like saying it out loud, I really, it's such a valuable thing. And I'm committing to you and listeners, and I'm, I'm going to start that practice tonight, no matter afraid or not. <laughs> You'll be surprised, first of all, that when your kid has something that really bugged him or uh, confused him, when in the saying of it, everything just kind of gets better suddenly you're going to have a kid who is emotionally intelligent beyond your wildest imaginings, who is capable of saying what he wants, our listener, whomever your kid is, capable of saying what they want without having to worry about retribution or punishment, because this is a place to do that. And you have to show up and not only be the great listener that you already are, but also not even flinch. Just say thank you. Yeah. Just thank you. Right. Thank you for telling me. Don't fucking make up some excuse. Like, right, right. oh, God, that's not why we're here. No, no it's no, just no, no. thank you yeah. for telling me. Thank you for and telling me. And that gives him a real safe, you know, space to, yep. you know, he's wildly, I mean, no surprise, right? I started taking him to workshops when he was in my belly. And, you know, he's really communicative and Uh, Most times his father is polar opposite of me. So there's a bit of, (laughs) you know, he's 10% his dad on that front. He's wildly communicative and so emotionally um, mature. 
But, you know, asking them that question, you know, without any defense or explaining and just giving them a platform and a safe space to say, this is how I feel. (laughs) That's exactly right. What happens to the kids is they start feeling like they're a little more grown up. Oh, I'm being given this responsibility to actually state my feelings. You know, they don't have the words like that, but that, you know, suddenly they have a voice in the conversation. I love it. it. It's beautiful. I'm going to do it. On Being Human is a best-selling book. I would love also to talk about any other projects that you have out there. Um, I also have combed through your site, of course, in preparation, and I noticed that you give private retreats. And I would love to talk about that because there is definitely at least one of our listeners who might be interested in collecting your wisdom and expertise for a small group, possibly even a corporate group. Um, And so I want to talk about that, too. I love how you think, Brower. Yeah. Um, I miss you, by the way. I just like oh. love hearing your voice, oh. and I, I have goosebumps right now. Um, oh. And it's funny with my site; it's like, and with everything, I can't really count for the last two years, so it hasn't been updated in quite some time because yes. the last two years didn't really exist, right? <laughs> mm. um, I used to, and I still do, I guess, um, retreats. I used to do them more often, um, but then you know, a thing called COVID came along. But I'm actually doing my first in-person one again in Ojai, which is where I always used to do them. I would do like four a year. And um, I know you'd been to that same place where I did them, but they don't do them there anymore. And I found a new place and I live here now. And it's really, um, it's my happy place besides Italy, really. And um, I'm doing my first one here. You know, these retreats and over time, I've gotten a lot more discerning with who comes. And I don't say that to sound, you know, um, elitist or anything. I just, I've done things before. I used to use like a company, you know, like when I went to the Galapagos and all you had to do was like click purchase and Galapagos is beautiful. (laughs) And those retreats were not my favorite because there was no um, integrity in terms of like who was showing up. You know, there were some people there that were like, well, it was a good deal for the Galapagos, you know, and I'm not not interested in that. Or someone who's like, you know, I want to learn how to do uh, a handstand. There's other things for that. So what I'm really, really concerned with, besides fun, because fun is so underrated, (laughs) is um, connection and community. And I only have one tattoo so far. And that says, I got you. It's the embodiment. You know, that's what I want to be. I want to be the embodiment of I got you and it's going to be okay. And I do a really good job of that, I think. You know, most things I don't do a good job with, but that I do. You know, having people feel uh, comfortable around me and safe. And, And so this experience, you know, I've made them more intimate as time goes on, but it's um it's a combination. I say yoga ish, but over time it's less yoga in terms of asana. But I do like to have body and breath work because it gets people out of their cerebral minds, you know? Yes, totally. Um, And able to go deeper. Mm -hmm. And lately, they focus on creativity. And I will not accept anyone saying they're not creative because that's bullshit. (laughs) So I have this one coming up. um, I'm co-leading it with my friend Krista Vernoff, who is the executive producer and showrunner of Grey's Anatomy and Station 19. But... She's also this like very much like you, you know, she's a healer and, oh, she just has this other side to her that people in Hollywood don't know. And we're doing this on being human creativity retreat. Um, And I can say this, it's very, um, it doesn't fit in any kind of box, which is something I talk about in my book. I call it the just a box, you know, like I'm just a mom. I'm just a yoga teacher. I'm just a waitress. I negate all of that. I think we're not just a box, we are the box. <laughs> so the retreat is just an experience of connection and joy and creativity. And I can never predict exactly what's going to happen, but it's where friendships of a lifetime get made. It's the most incredible thing I've ever seen, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, but like I said, I'm discerning now. I, and all that means is I ask people, like, what's called you to reach out? Tell me something about you. And there's so much you can learn, right? And what that does, just like asking your child, is it gets people to reflect, uh-huh, why am I called to go to Costa Rica with Elena and a group of 
20 other people or why am I called to this experience? Mm. And they get to get really clear. And that doesn't mean that their expectation will be met, whatever story they've made up of what it's going to be like, but it gets them to really acknowledge like their desire, their want, what they're, what they're hoping for, all of it. And I focus a lot on not taking ourselves too seriously. It's a huge part of my practice right now, actually, is not taking myself too seriously and making fun happen as often as possible. Right? Silliness. Why? It's like, okay, so I did a keynote um, two weeks ago, which was so amazing. And I'm so proud of myself because it was postponed for two years. It was for She Recovers, um, which is beautiful. I hope everyone listening will check them out. You know, when I first got the job two years ago, I had imposter syndrome because I wasn't in recovery for substance abuse, but that's not why they hired me, you know? They hired me for recovery from an eating disorder and shame and all the other things. Anyway, I'm, I gave this keynote and this group of 500 women were like the funnest, most joyful, amazing people. And, you know, I was in the elevator go, when I first got there and I go, holy shit. All right. Screw Disneyland. These are the happiest people on earth. But also the idea that fun doesn't necessarily need to require substances. I'm not judging, doesn't uh, either way, but that like we can let ourselves be silly and free and joyful and childlike and yes. dorky yes. and weird, you know? Yes. So beautiful. First of all, She Recovers Conference is run by one of my dearest business partners, Taryn Strong. Oh, I love her. Hi, Taryn. Hi, T. If you listen to this, um, she's done such an incredible job along with her mom and her team of creating this just sublime gathering. And I'm so glad it happened in person again. Um, when it comes to the shame, mm -hmm. what if our listener is still feeling this sense of shame? I would love for you to speak to them, him or her, and give us a little intuitive sort of teaching from your heart about the importance of letting go of shame, losing the shame. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that you're asking this. So dear listener, um, my theory, especially one that became more crystal clear at the beginning of COVID when I had a breakdown, uh, I had a breakdown because I was like, oh, I did all the work. I read all the books. I wrote the book. <laughs> Oops, I didn't have daily practices in place. Um, uh, practice you, right? <laughs> I didn't have these daily practices in place. And that was the missing link. And I thought, okay, so with shame, it's the same thing. You know, I call it your inner asshole because I'm a potty mouth, but shame, it's this putting it down on the daily. I mean, you might not have to, but for me, what's happened is I have thought, oh, I got rid of my inner asshole. I got rid of my shame and I've woken up and it's in bed with me again. So oh, okay, it means it's daily practices. And circling back to this idea of fun or making things light because we make things really hard and life is already really hard, there's some tools. Now, I feel like I'm an expert in shame because, you know, many people may have heard this story, but when I was eight, my dad was my best friend and he said, uh, you're being bad and making me not feel good. And I said, I hate you. And he dropped dead that night. That's the last thing I ever said to him. And so I embodied that. I embodied Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold yeah. on. That was the last thing you said to him. Yes, Elena. And that he, was. And he just so happened to have what, a heart attack? What? Yeah, well, you know, he just so happened to be an addict. And so my father, may he rest in peace, smell, smoked four packs of cools a day. And he did uppers and downers. And, you know, I didn't know. So I had learned, this is so wild, I had learned in school how bad smoking was. So I flushed his cigarettes down the toilet and I thought it was so funny and he got so mad. Now, mind you, he's about to die. Like, I don't know how many hours later he did die, but so he's in no mood. So I flushed the cigarettes down the toilet and he's like, where are my cigarettes? And I'm like, I don't know, grinning. And he said, come on, you're being bad and making me not feel good. So this is the 80s, Elena. He's like, Okay, go across the street. There was this tiny little store across the street where you could buy um, cigarettes, lottery tickets, play video games, and like get bread and cheese. 
so my father said, go across the street. This was in the eighties. You could go send your kid to get your cigarettes. He said, go across the street and get me a hard pack of cools and a pound of American cheese thinly sliced. And I said, Oh, you always break your promises. I hate you. And I ran out and that was that. And so I embodied that. I took that on and I decided it was my fault. I mean, he said it. He said, you're being bad. I'm making me not feel good. I was eight. So makes sense. You know what we do as a child. So if you can imagine listener, I was a walking shame bomb. Everything I was in myself. That was my belief at the, at the deepest level. So of course it makes sense that you know, I left school and, and I kept staying at a place I was miserable because I believe this is all I get. I'm a bad person. I'm a bad, no good, rotten, terrible person. Mm. You know, and then I became a yoga teacher. And, and the part I'm leaving out is I finally went on antidepressants. And my God, did that save my life? Um, I'm clear that it was me, obviously, that saved my life. But really, they without them, I, I don't know where I'd be. And I was able to start this life I have now, but it really, it wasn't until I started teaching and teaching the work I'm doing now. And that's because I don't feel good unless I'm in alignment with what I'm teaching. And I believe you're the same way. I never don't want to be walking the talk. And so I realized, you know, these people would be coming to me with eating disorders or whatever it was. And I was like, oh, huh. Mm-hmm. Now, I may not be like 90 pounds, but I was still dealing with a lot of shit and hiding my hearing loss. And then I began, I began to like really put it down. And then, you know, now I share the tools that I use. Um, I start my day with a prayer. I call it the body prayer because it's generated from our own body. Meaning I'll invite you listener to place your hands on a body part. It could be somewhere you feel ashamed of or connected to or disconnected from or in pain or your hands could be on your head if you're like monkey mind is going round and round and then I ask you to get quiet and either you know think or just whisper I love you and I'm listening to that body part for as long as you can and when you're done you open your eyes and you write for five minutes just like a brain dump uh like if that body part could speak what would it say And from there you get things like, let's say your hands are on your belly and you're like, I'm so full or whatever shit you're talking to yourself. Right. But you can look at those words and turn it into something that you want to make a prayer. And the prayer starts with the words, may I remember, because I believe it's what we've already known. We just forgot. So maybe it's like, may I remember I get to nourish myself. May I remember to breathe? I mean, whatever it is, right? May I remember not to take myself too seriously? (laughs) So I start my day without looking at my phone. I try. And with these words of what I want to remember, how do I want to feel? Who do I want to be today? What levity do I want to bring into my day? Um, That's one of them. You know, other tools are like really paying close attention who my people are, who I'm surrounding myself with. Are they reminding me who I really am? Or are they reflecting back to me, reinforcing back to me that I think I'm a piece of shit, right? Writing a letter, a breakup letter to your inner asshole or to shame. So there's lots of tools and we do them on a daily basis. You have to do all of them on a daily basis, but every day, putting it down, every day, putting it down. Not today, shame, not today. Mm. It's so beautiful to hear you talk with such clarity about just It's like taking a hot knife through butter and just slicing it. It's so clear. No, you know what I mean? It's so clear. So clear about this. Shame is so insidious. We don't even realize. And I'm listening to you talk and I'm thinking, oh my God, I need to do this daily. It's insidious. That's what I always say about it. And that's the thing. Um, And so many of us, myself included, we have blind spots Mm. and, um, the way that we can identify them, I think, is pausing, is getting quiet, is doing those brain dumps, right? Is writing um, without worry is like if this is good or literary or funny or none of that. It's just like, bleh. Um, but really, really trying to find our blind spots of where shame is keeping us small or or having us pretend. I don't want to ever pretend again. And that, oh, I couldn't be more clear on anything in my life. Nothing. I will never again pretend. I will never hide in shame again. And that does not mean 
that I share everything despite what anyone may think. Mm. Hell to the no. It just means I won't hide in shame. Mm. So beautiful. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. It's good. It feels good to be clear. And, you know, I thought my next book was going to be right on time. That was the title. I think that's still part of it. It's not the title, but I used to think I was always late with everything. And I think a lot of people feel that way, especially women. You know, I had Charlie at 41 and my book came out at 44 and I'm right on time. And so the clarity I have now, right on time, mm. you know, in my 40s, my late 40s, rather than like, you know, because it's easy, right, to pick up Instagram and look at someone who's like 27 and seems like, wow, they have it figured out. Well, A, they probably don't, but it's easy. <laughs> um, we're right on time. Nobody has it figured out at 27, first of all. I, I know. I do. I, know. I feel like the older we get, the smarter, the better, the more confident, and the more clear, and weirdly, the more teachable. Oh, I want to be the most like teachable my whole entire life. Yes. You know, like yes. that is always want to be a student, always want to be learning. That's it right there. That's exactly I, it. I am. Um, one of my favorite quotes, I heard Wayne say it, but I think it's Mark Twain. And I say it every day of my life because it's one of my guiding principles. It's not what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you think you know for sure that just ain't so. Woo-wee. That's it. Right? That's because it. I know you, like me, have people who come again and again and again. And I love it. And I used to get insecure because I was like, oh, my God, they've heard me. There are some things I say that are tried and true and exercises, and I will keep doing them because they're good and they work. And I worry, oh my God, they've heard this before. And then two things I realized. One, we learn by repetition, mm -hmm, or at least I do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And two, it's never going to land the same. It's never going to be the same group of people. You're never going to be the same. So if we come in with that attitude, like, well, I know this all, we are losing you know, if we constantly are just open, like, hey, I may have heard this before, but what can I get from it this time? We're yeah. always going to get something. Yeah. Yeah. So beautiful. I would like to close by asking you three questions that I ask most, but not all of my guests. And they go way past what you think the question is asking you, and, and you can get as creative as you like. One. What is your favorite view? <laughs> okay, so my ears, are you saying view like with a V or you like me? Oh, either one, but I'm saying view with a V. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yes. So I thought you said, what's your favorite you? And I'm like, well, last night I made a video with the purple wig filter and I love her. <laughs> um, okay, my favorite view. Wow, that's so good. I am going to say right in this moment, I'm looking out my window of my office at a plant that I recently cried over. It's an angel's trumpet, which is known to be poisonous. That's another story, but it's this gorgeous yellow plant flower, it looks like. And it used to be right outside my window, like, like I could touch it. And my husband recently cut it down and moved it because our neighbor with one leg across the street told him that it was intertwined with the tree and it had to be cut down. And, and I cried and I was angry and it felt like, um, I don't know if this is going to make sense. I felt devastated and it made me happy when I walked up to my house and it wasn't there anymore. And I think it was this sort of validation of the other shoes going to drop. Okay. Bear with me, people keep listening. So plant was gone. And I was like, <gasps> see the other shoe dropped. So my husband moved it a little farther out into the front yard and everyone was like, it's never going to rebloom. It just won't. And it's in full motherfucking bloom right now. I'm looking at it. How is that even possible? I mean, how is that possible? Those are the things. I, I don't know. Magic. And maybe also, let's be honest, the people who said that no one knows people talk out their butthole. You know? I mean, when he moved it because our neighbor, I love Greg. Um, I'm looking at this beautiful flowering plant and my next book is called You Get to Have This. And that comes from 
when you met me, Elena, for 19 years, I've been living in a one bedroom apartment, 500 square feet, very open about that, you know, no shame, blind spot. I thought that was the life, like, that's all I get in this life, you know, and I bought my own house a year ago. And shortly after I had a terrible thought, which was, I don't get to be this happy. And I caught myself and I stood up and on a sticky note, I wrote, "Uh uh-uh, no motherfucker. And I wrote, I get to have this. And I stuck it on the wall. And that's one of the reminders for shame loss, you know, sticky notes. So I look at that, I get to have this. And so me looking out at that tree blooming, I get to have this. And it doesn't mean the house or even the tree. It just means happiness. It means whatever I want it to mean. (laughs) Yeah. Every single uh, person listening right now or into the future, you do get to have what you have. You did some sort of something in order to claim that. And you might as well claim it now because life is extremely short, as evidenced by Jennifer's experience. And yeah, uh, we can't waste any more time on shame. It's the takeaway that I have here. Well, absolutely. And I want to offer that. It's often a blind spot. If I say to you, I have people write, I get to have this on a sticky note. I love sticky notes. And then I ask them, what's your this? Say that sentence. I get to have this. What's your this? And sometimes look like a deer in headlights. So then I say, all right, what does your inner asshole say you don't get to have? And then it becomes very clear. Rest, ease, joy without booze, right? Whatever it is. (laughs) Then, oh, okay, okay, I get it. And so like for me, it was, I don't get to be this happy was like, you know, I don't get to not be on high alert that the other shoe is going to drop. I don't get to have five minutes where I'm not feeling guilty and bad bullshit. I get to have this. So that yellow plant looking at it, but what tops that is my sleeping son. I got to say, I could just watch him sleeping like forever. That was mine. Mine was uh, actually from You know when you see your little boy's, the back of his neck, like behind his ear and down? Yes. Yes. That's that's mine. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Totally, totally. But sleeping is a close second by far. He was just sick and I got called in to sleep and make sure that he's, you know, able to breathe through the night, turn on the steam shower, do all the things for him overnight. And it was such a joy. You know, he's a teenager, full size, full man. And oh my God, what a privilege to, wow, to sleep next to him again. It was so good. So good. Um, Second question, what does prayer mean to you? In the words of Mary Oliver, I don't know what a prayer is, (laughs) Um, but I, what is it? I do know how to lie in the grass. Um, You know, I think a prayer can be anything, but um, often a prayer is an invocation with a V, invocation, or rather, or even an invitation for us to remember. And whatever that can look like, it could be a walking prayer, it could be a dancing prayer. It doesn't all have to be about the self either. You know, may I remember, you know, that I get to have this, may I remember that I don't have to compare myself, but like, may I remember what I'm grateful for? May I remember the beauty of whatever it may be? It's um, an invocation to remember because it is so easy to forget. Mm. So beautiful. Thank you so much for that. I think the third question is actually usually the first, but I've saved it for last. What in your world or in the sort of larger context needs healing right now? It's an interesting question. I've been thinking about healing a lot lately um, because I'm always careful not to say healed as as if it's past tense, you know, because again, daily practices, it's ongoing. Every day I'm healing. Um, It sort of reflects back to what I said about prayer. I think healing is remembering um, who we were before the world got to us or before we were abused or before we made a um, false decision about ourselves or the inner asshole told us something coming back to our most uh, pure self, (laughs) Um, reclaiming joy and what we get to have, which is ease. And I I don't mean that everything's going to be easy, but we do get to have ease. We just make things so much harder. Um, 
Healing is also, again, back to the words I end my book with, now what? It's the now what? It's not just the being self-aware because it's very important to be self-aware, but then it's like the now what? And it could be the smallest, littlest thing, right? It can be subtle, um, but the now what? So with my eating disorder, which, you know, is it's not active, but it's always there threatening me over my shoulder um, because it's the path of least resistance, right? If I'm stressed out, the easier place to go is there. So the healing is the now what? It's going, okay, well, it's there over my shoulder. Now what? Now what am I going to do instead? Or now what? What is the best choice for me right now? What is the healthiest choice? Mm -hmm. What is the thing that is going to allow me to put my head down at the end of the night and say, I did love today. Mm. And that's a, in fact, I want to send you a gift. And that's my quote, this little, I have like, you know, I have it on various things, but it says, when I get to the end of my life and I ask one final, what have I done? Let my answer be, I have done love, but I've reclaimed it to when I get to the end of my day <laughs> or when I get to the end of my podcast or the end of my workshop, right? It's always like, did I do love today? If I'm doing something that's harmful to myself or to others, that's not. And the caveat to that is if that is the case, I have to let myself off the hook mm. and begin again tomorrow. Yep. I love the uh, the nature of this is such that there's always a way out and there's always a way in. Yes. Woo! Yes, yes, yes. I love that. Very beautiful. Very beautiful. Um, I would be honored to be part of anything that you are offering, my dear sister. I'd love to FaceTime, you know, because I see your face and, and it is easier. But um, yeah, the shame loss, last year I launched it and um, I did three and only one of them had a guest and that was Paulina Porskova, mm. who's my beautiful buddy, friend, fellow What weirdo. a hero. No, what a hero. I watch her. I clock her. And what yeah, a, what a story. Yeah. What a fucking she's story. The, she's the coolest and the realest and yeah. smart as shit, people listening. I mean, watch out. Mm, mm. That woman is brainy as the day is long. And, you know, all her life, it was always focused on her looks. And so that wasn't the thing that was nurtured. But my God, she is just like one of the smartest people I've ever met. And um so she did one with me um, on shame around aging. <laughs> and, um, you know, the people who come, it doesn't even have to be a, that they're coming for that per se, but it's coming together in community um, to slay shame together, at least for today. It, it's always got to be at least for today. And that's the new thing in my life. And it's not like, you know, I invented that, even though I think I, I like to think I did. I know like AA, everything day by day, but Everything has to be just for today because yeah. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Come yeah. on. Yeah. It's part of also uh, Reiki training just for today. Great. Yes. Um, and I firmly believe that what you're doing, especially with somebody like Paulina, um, with anyone whom you would have as a guest, what you're doing is vitally important for our community. What you're doing is helping people stop bypassing the truth of pain and actually start to alchemize it already. <laughs> that's, that's it. It's yeah. alchemizing it. And yeah. the idea of bypassing, which I did for a long time, not with toxic positivity, no, quite the opposite. I bypassed it by just denying it and just shoving it back into my body or right. over exercising, you know, we always bypassing, but it's um, alchemizing it. And I don't, I always say, look, maybe there's a gift in it. I cannot stand when people try to get someone to see a gift in something without any time having lapsed. Mm. 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 I like that, that feels like bypassing, at least to me. I mean, maybe you've heard the story or, you know, readers, but like when my foot broke, I was leading a retreat here in Ojai opening circle, like 45 people. And in fact, I had gone off my meds and I was slipping. I was starting to overexercise. I was not in a good place. And I broke my foot and boy, did I spiral. So I broke my foot opening night of the retreat and I'm at the ER and I'm really upset. And I post on Facebook, it's broken. And someone goes, this is your yoga. 
And I just wanted to punch him through the screen and the nose. I'm like, you know, I, I can't say that yet. Now I could say that years later. But like in the ER, when I'm in pain and I'm hurting, I'm not there yet. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Thank you very little for your comment. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, or uh, my friends like child died and someone goes, well, they're an angel now, you know, just let us feel the feeling. And then after maybe a gift will come of it. Maybe you can make art of it. M- let us hope. But first we must digest it and feel it. And if there is something to feel right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, woman. I can't thank you for all of your, uh, your heart, your gumption, your potty mouth. <laughs> Oops, uh, I hope you don't have to beep it out. But oh well. no, no, no. I curse all the time. It's fine. Um, I want to thank you for your heart most of all because I think it's touching a lot of us. And uh, I don't know if you hear it enough, but I'm here to tell you it's touching so many of us. And I thank you for it. Well, that makes me teary, and that that's exciting because um, I'm writing an essay now about how I can't cry, and then I just switched my meds, and now I can a little. So it's like <gasps> uh, feeling feels really good, friends. Wow. <laughs> and um, I'm really excited when I'm able to get. It's not that I don't feel; it's like it's emotional constipation, if you will. Mm-hmm. But I just got teary because you know what is better than feeling seen or heard? Yes, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing Thank at you. All. You're Thank welcome. you. I love you, and I will I hear you. from you soon. Yeah, I love you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>